The first thing I want to say is that uh, in terms of the Brexit vote, uh, I really want to stress that I believe this is a values divide and not about the left behind or a group of people who feel that they've lost out in globalization or are economically falling behind. And I think the evidence for not only Brexit but for the Trump vote and for the populist right in uh, continental Europe tells us a very similar story. It's about education, not income. So here are those blue bars. If you look at the people without qualifications, the low educated uh, group here, you can see about 50% of them voted uh, Brexit in this survey, and this is a YouGov survey I conducted in late August, uh, which, by the way, has a skew towards Remain, so it's actually, these numbers should all be a little bit higher, but it doesn't matter, it we can compare these groups pretty well. So amongst those without qualification, 50% of the low income, sorry, amongst the low income uh, group here, 50% voted Brexit, amongst the high income group about sort of 35. So it is true that the lower income group did vote Brexit to a greater degree, than the upper income group. However, if we look at education, the gap is much larger. Almost 70% of those without qualifications voting Brexit, and only about 25% of those with degrees voting Brexit. Education and not income, and in fact, when we put education in, income hardly matters. Only the poorest group is significantly more likely to have voted Brexit. An FT piece came out looking at the local authorities of England and Wales. Again, you plot percent with a degree down here, percentage share of the vote for leave, and these are actual election results. It's a very tight relationship, whereas the median weekly gross earnings, measure of income, and Brexit vote, it's a much looser, weaker relationship. So again, why is it that education level matters so much and income does not? Okay, and I think part of this is because education is, matters because it's linked to worldview, not because it's linked to income. So this is a question, it's an outrageous question called, you know, the question is, should sex criminals be publicly whipped? Now, before I go any further, this is a question that's been asked for many years by social psychologists, which I am not. But still, what's interesting is how dramatically it sort of cuts the cake on uh, voting leave. Those who strongly disagree with this statement only Barely 20% voted leave, and those who very much agree, 75%. Um, I could replace this. In fact, I ran a survey in the US uh, on Trump rating him from 0 to 10. And you can replace this voting leave with Trump 0 to 10. You get exactly the same graph, not just in terms of people who very much agree, differing widely from those who disagree, but also the way the graph steps up. So those who agree somewhat, you know, majority voted leave, and they also rate Trump a lot higher than those who disagree. What I'm saying here is there's a values base. It's something which social psychologists here would call authoritarianism. But really, I don't think it's a particularly good characterization. I think it's people who like clear moral boundaries, order. I think closed open gets at it, but it's partly about this idea of desire for stability and order and safety and not for novelty change difference. Um, the firm Cultural Dynamics, run by Pat Dade, who does a lot of polling work for uh, political parties for companies and for other organizations asks this question on whipping sex criminals as one of 100 or 200 questions. And then they try and map where people are in terms of how they answer these questions on different uh, issues. So here the question is, are there too many foreigners in the UK strongly agree? And that people who answer that whipping sex criminals light up in red. So that's a very strong overrepresentation <laughs> on this statement. But of course, what we can see is that's close to a number of other values dimensions around security, safety, rules, and so on. So those, these sets of orientations tend to cluster around in this region, which are known as the, as the settlers, according to Dade and uh, his cultural dynamics team. This is again to say that it's these cultural values and not economic situation that really matters. Whereas down here, those who are high on adventure, stimulation, creativity, forgiveness, and all these other non-political questions, values questions, are coming up strongly, uh, sorry, strongly against this statement that there are too many foreigners in the UK. If you look at hardcore negative on the EU, this is before the vote, it's pretty much the same map. The same people who are saying there are too many foreigners are also hardcore negative on EU. That's again a finding that we see in other forms of data. It's not the same as the left-right question. This question, 
uh, decline in compassion is a problem in society. Many of these people who are strong leave voters actually kind of agree with that. You know, this decline in compassion is a problem. It's not these people who are the sort of social dominant, uh, perhaps into consumption and display people. So it's not a left-right issue. It cuts across the left-right boundary. Not only that, the, the map looks very similar if we look at UK on this too many foreigners question, if we look at France on the too many foreigners question, if we look at Germany on the too many foreigners question, a little bit different, a bit more of a social dominance profile in Germany. But again, we're getting very similar kinds of mappings of values. It's values that are really telling us who is going to be anti-immigrant. And actually, immigration is absolutely critical to the right-wing populism of today. It was critical to the Brexit and Trump votes. And I'll show you this here with this uh, again, this is from this late August YouGov survey I did on um, UK opinion. Ask people, who did you, what did you vote you in the referendum? And what do you think is the most important issue facing Britain today? Those who said immigration is the most important issue facing Britain today, uh, or sorry, um, people who voted Brexit, over 40% said immigration is, my, is the number one issue facing Britain. Whereas amongst Remainers, only 5% said it was their number one issue. So that is an absolutely massive gap. Nothing like that on the economy or inequality. So if we're going to talk about the left behind or losers of globalization, why is it the case that Remainers are much more worried about inequality? 20% say it's their number one issue than Leavers, 5%. Again, I just don't think that argument stacks up. And the sooner it dies, the better, uh, really. It's a values issue, and immigration is really what's driving um, this division. Now, we can also see this other ways. It's true that some people say, well, you know, places that have very low proportions of ethnic minorities tended to vote leave. And that's true. But places where there was an increase in ethnic minorities or East European uh, immigrants tended to be more likely to vote leave as well. So it's that change. This down here, we have the point increase in uh, East European share in local authority in the 2000s. So a place that had a 10% increase in um, A8 immigration in the 2000s tended to vote, on average, 67% leave compared to about 52% for those who had a zero point increase. The scales are going to be affected a little bit by the fact that we've controlled for a couple of variables here, such as proportion white British. OK, so I've kind of tried to make the case that we have an expression. The Brexit vote was kind of an expression of two Britons, one uh, in values terms, which is more open to change and diversity, and the other, which is more concerned with stability, order, security. So these are two different states of mind. They're not geographically distinct places, but they do have somewhat of a geographic expression, which I'm going to explore. So for example, if you look at places such as Oxford and Cambridge and perhaps Norwich, which have a very high share of university graduates, they are going to have be, be much more likely to have voted um, uh, remain, so a low leave vote, whereas places such as Barking and Dagenham or um, Boston and Lincolnshire and so on, I hate to pick on Boston, but essentially these places would have had a much higher uh, leave vote. However, I think Sunder is right. I don't know if he got to this in his talk, but actually it's the divisions within communities that are much stronger than the divisions between them. So we've picked some extreme places, but actually for most people in most places, it's divisions within communities that matter more than between. So the two Britons is really about a state of mind, but it does have geographic expression. And I'm just going to skip this is about age. So there are older places. And there are places that have a larger share of well-educated people with degrees. And they're, and they're going to have different voting patterns. So it's true that these two states of mind do have some geographic expression. But what's really important, I think, for the integration and cohesion discussion, and where I'm going to try and tie that in with the Brexit thing, is around ethnicity. Uh, because we, do, we know, and this is from Martin Rosenbaum's recent BBC data looking at the Brexit vote uh, at ward level, um, that, at, for example, places with a 90% non-white share tended to have only about a 25% uh, vote to leave, whereas those that had zero minorities, uh, it's closer to 60. Um, so the, you know, ethnic minorities were much, more, much less likely to vote leave, although many ethnic minorities did vote leave. Uh, it's, it's important also, if in fact 
ethnic minorities are increasingly or becoming concentrated geographically, then that will contribute to a two Britons phenomenon. As we note in the US, um, residential segregation is extremely high and partisan segregation is also very high. At, and that partisan segregation is not because Democrats move to Democrat areas, it's largely because um, you know, whites tend to vote Republican and whites tend to live in white areas and vice versa for minorities. Are we seeing some kind of a situation of this nature developing in Britain uh, and creating this two Britons phenomenon? Uh, and this is just dividing it by blue as leave and, and yellow as remain. And this is more to population scale. Uh, there is a point about geography that I don't want to make too. It's not just about people who are, let's say, well-educated or ethnic minorities moving to areas that are um, diverse. Uh, it's also the case that the, co eth the composition of your area will have an effect on your attitudes. So even if you don't have a degree, if you live in Cambridge, because the people with degrees set the tone and the tone is a remain tone, that does rub off on you to some extent. So there are these contextual effects which accentuate some of the differences that we see in the opinion data. What's the picture like then residentially? Well, the picture essentially residentially, which I think, and this is something I'll mention about the Casey Review on integration, is that the split between white Britain and minority Britain has not changed and is not uh, becoming more integrated. So 80% of the wards in England and Wales are on average 90% white. Uh, half of the minorities of England and Wales live in just 500 wards out of almost 9,000 in England and Wales. So that's an exceptionally high degree of concentration. Uh, and obviously London, cities like London, Birmingham, Manchester, and so forth are, tend to be the areas where you see minority concentration. These are also, coincidentally, areas that tended to vote remain. Whereas much of the rest of Britain, the other 8,000 wards tended to be, uh, tend to be much less diverse, much more likely to have voted to leave. The Casey Review focused a lot on the sort of most isolated, extreme, hard to reach groups. Not, not only groups, but um, elements within groups. So very conservative Muslim women. Uh, fundamentalist uh, Muslims living in divided cities such as Oldham and Burnley or Blackburn. And I think that's absolutely necessary and Casey was right to do that, but that's a very, very small number of people um, as a percentage of the total, it's, it's pretty small. So while attention does need to be paid to these areas, uh, I think more attention could be paid to some of the bigger trends that affect more people and are, have a greater impact on the integration picture in the UK. And actually, the big trend, I think, is white avoidance or uh, is actually white British behavior and not ethnic minority behavior. Ethnic minority self-segregation is actually, I think, becoming less of an issue if you look at the data, whereas white British self-segregation is actually becoming more of an issue or is remaining a very important issue. So I want to talk a little bit about that question of white avoidance, white flight, which I talked a lot about in my policy exchange blog on the Casey Review, where I said majority avoidance is one of the few holes. But it's an important omission that really didn't see a lot of attention in Casey and is, is an extremely important contributor to this two Britons polarization. And, and we'll see this in, this in this chart here, which looks at segregation by ethnic group um, in London and other major cities. And this is uh, from Gemma Catney at the University of Liverpool. And what you can see is that all ethnic groups, all ethnic minority groups, have seen a decline in the 2000s in their segregation. So Bangladeshis have moved out of Tower Hamlets. Just to use some London examples, um, Bangladeshis have moved out of Tower Hamlets. Afro-Caribbeans have, have been moving out of Brixton to other parts of London. So individual ethnic groups are moving out of their areas of concentration. They're not actually self-segregating. They're doing the reverse. The only group where we see an increase in their segregation, that is, their distribution vis-a-vis -vis what we would expect by chance if we randomly distributed this group according to the population density of the country. The only group seeing an increase are the white British, most especially in inner and outer London, but also in other urban areas. So what's going on then um, with, with this white British segregation, and how is it important in the, in the story of two Britons? I mean, again, 
Um, there's no better way of illustrating this than what happened in London in the 2000s. London's population increased by over a million, and at the same time, London lost over 600,000 white British people. Now, that's not just because it's one in, one out, and there's nowhere to live. 40% of immigrants were accommodated through crowding more people into each housing unit. So what actually occurred was that white Britons, particularly white British people with families, when they go to settle down, avoided uh, London. Not only did they avoid London, but they tended to avoid the diverse areas of London. So here, the wards, these, each dot is a ward, wards that had a higher increase, in this case, a 6,000 increase in ethnic minorities, 3,000 decrease in white British <coughs> at the same time. And that relationship's a strong one, and it holds not only in London, but in Birmingham, in Manchester, and city after city in the United Kingdom. We see this pattern, minorities in, white British out. What's so I don't think this is, and in fact, I've done some analysis. This is not white flight. It's not whites thinking, ooh, I don't feel safe. I'm going to leave. That's not what's going on. All that's occurring is that a lot of these cities have a lot of population turnover all the time. It's a bit like a bathtub uh, with, with the hot and cold taps. If you turn one of the taps off, then the, the composition of the bathtub is going to change a lot. So it's about white avoidance, simply not moving into diverse areas. Whereas the relatively white parts of London actually retained their white British population quite well, but didn't attract a lot of minorities. Um, visually, we can see this in this map if we compare Bangladeshis and white Britons. Bangladeshis are concentrated in inner London here. Uh, where do they move to? They moved to parts of London that were not where they were concentrated. So in fact, they left the areas they were concentrated for these parts of outer London, which had fewer Bangladeshis. So they moved away from themselves, essentially, in the 2000s. White British, we see a very different picture, actually. White British are concentrated more in outer London, particularly in the southern parts of London and east. Where did white British move to in the 2000s? Largely in towards areas where they were already strong, with a few exceptions, such as Islington and Hackney, where you had gentrification. But in terms of people with families settling down, what's going on essentially is white British are moving towards their own concentrations, which is, some, which is a different pattern than we see with minority groups. Casey doesn't have a lot to say about this and doesn't have a lot to say about residential segregation full stop. The only thing I saw here was we want to improve our understanding of how housing and regeneration policies can improve integration and reduce segregation. Pretty tepid stuff, doesn't really, but actually I don't want to fault Casey because it's, there's not a whole lot of policy research on how we address ethnic segregation. There's a lot of talk about having a mix uh, of, of, of wealthy and poor residents in a housing development, but very little talk about what to do about ethnic segregation. It's a very tricky area. And so we can kind of think in just the last few slides here, we can kind of think of a few possible uh, ways to address this, many of which I have to confess are pretty blue sky. So we can go with uh, enforcement, where it's about incentivizing uh, you to change your behavior, <coughs> speed fine. Or there's this concept of nudge, which is that we change your environment and work on some of your psychology. So your uh, you feel bad that you're speeding because you see a sad face, so maybe you'll slow down. Uh, this is less intrusive because the, the thing is, if we were very intrusive like the Singapore government, Singapore doesn't have any ethnic segregation. Government tells you where you're going to live, and it engineers segregation out of existence. But if you give people choice, they will become segregated. So what can you maybe do in a free country? Uh, I don't know. There are some possible things that... that uh, I've been thinking about, but nobody's really done research on them. I mean, one could be uh, on home design. Would it be the case that period homes with gardens might be attractive to white British people uh, and might keep them in diverse areas? Because part of what, what this is about is trying to, to encourage white British people to remain in moderately diverse areas, um, areas from, say, 50 to 80 percent white. But those kinds of areas tend to tip and become less, uh, less white. So perhaps building that kind of a home might help to, to attract more white Britons to, to live in places like Newham uh, or parts of Birmingham, which are, are quite diverse. Um, there's an interesting paper on schooling, because schools are even more segregated than neighborhoods um, and ethnically segregated. And, and one of the, this paper found that parents, particularly white parents in America, tended to hugely overestimate the share of ethnic minorities in schools. 
So it could be the case that if you published accurate ethnic composition information for schools, people might, might again, this has not been proven, might become a little bit more, uh, a little less fearful about the actual composition of those schools and maybe more willing to send their, their pupils there. So that's another possibility. And then finally, school brochure uh, design. We know that sometimes brochures are designed with more ethnic minorities just to, to make ethnic minorities feel more comfortable about applying to a particular school or program. I don't see why you couldn't do it the reverse way, that in diverse areas put a few more white faces on than you might otherwise uh, from the actual composition of the school to try and retain uh, whites in those areas. So just to conclude, I talked a bit about the Brexit vote as an expression of, uh, of a kind of two Britons polarization. Um, in terms of integration and cohesion, a lot of the residential trends I've talked about are actually reproducing or intensifying this two Britons phenomenon. Diverse areas are getting even more diverse. Whites are not, uh, are avoiding those kinds of areas. And even though individual ethnic concentrations are dispersing, because of white avoidance, we're maintaining these two Britons, one incredibly white, one very diverse, and not coincidentally, those are now also expressing themselves in voting patterns. So this risk of two Britons, again, not as extreme as two Americas, but are we moving in that direction? Something to think about. <laughs>